What is up you guys, I'm Charmix and today I'm going to be reacting to Film Theory uh, Ready Player One's True Threat Spoiler Free by The Film Theorist. Now if you guys haven't seen Ready Player One, you don't. I guess you don't have to worry because this is a spoiler free version so you're not, it's not going to ruin anything for you. But yeah anyway, hopefully this is going to be quite interesting. The original link's in the description. Make sure you go subscribe to The Game Theorist without any further ado. Let's begin. Also forgive me if I, I'm not like making sense like when I'm talking. I don't know why but I found today my thoughts aren't getting across or it's getting a harder to something's wrong with my head fun fact did you know that i started on youtube in 2011 the same year that ernest klein wrote ready player one and look at both of us now we both have published books uh, uh nope sorry i guess that's just him but we both have millions of dollars in licensing and residuals no, again, I guess that's definitely him and not me. But, hey, we both have a blockbuster movie hitting theaters no time soon. That's, again, just Ernest Klein. Well, <laughs> shoot, what have I been doing with all my time? Screw you, Ernest! No one likes an overachiever. Oh, I mean, you have, you know, the, the film theorists. You have this channel. You also have uh, the game theorists, which is another big channel. They're both in the millions of subscribers. You also have your, um... He has a uh, MatPat has another channel where he does like live videos, I believe, and that one I think is around a million subscribers. I'm not completely sure, but most of the channels you have on YouTube are in the millions of subscribers, and I believe you're also getting. I think you're getting married or something. I believe uh, MatPat uh, posted on like Twitter or something that he's getting married. It's either that or he's having a kid. One of the one. Of, no, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think he's having a kid. I mean, you've been quite successful. I think most of us would agree. Anyway. Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, where, come to think of it, I do have something in common with Ernest Klein. People only care about us because we created properties that ride off of people's nostalgia. Feels good, man. Feels good. Now, as one of the hardest core nerds out there, you'd think I'd be sweating through my tube socks at the idea of Ready Player One. Set in the year 2044, it's a futuristic sci-fi movie about a treasure hunt happening in the most advanced, massive multiplayer online game in history called Oasis, or ontologically anthropocentric sensory immersive simulation. It's got the good guy, Wade, fighting against the evil corporation to find the ultimate video game easter egg that promises to give the player a massive fortune and control over- if only VR was actually this cool. Like, I mean, maybe five years down the road we'll have some really cool VR gamers, but for the most part, I believe... I believe a lot of people said that, you know, like, VR... You, you basically just have VR chat, which is this. Hey, I know, we need this. This is like... Oh, oh, what? Oh, God, no, don't say... Ah! So, uh... Yeah, uh, the future is what we have to look forward to. So, yeah, maybe five years down the road, or ten years down the road, or 20 years down the road, we'll have some really cool, you know, uh, virtual reality. Over the entire game. The premise is truly impressive, but there are a few bones I gotta pick with this thing. You see, in the movie, the reason why most of the people spend all their time in the Oasis is that most of the population lives in IRL poverty, including our hero, Wade. And hey, I'm all about the underdog coming out of nothing and fighting the powers that be. It's the story of every good YouTuber that I know. But the world of Ready Player One gets so ridiculous sometimes that if you actually look at it using real Psy, instead of just sci-fi, our buddy Wade literally wouldn't survive the opening credits. And no, I'm not talking about some super advanced technology where someone's getting zapped with fiber optic cables or getting their memory wiped by their own haptic suit. Let's face it, by 2044, technology will be so advanced that there's really no way to predict the state of video games or personal technology. I can only sit here and salivate thinking at how great things will be and start worshipping my Google overlords now. No, I'm talking way more basic than that. The biggest threat in this movie isn't technology or evil corporations or even really bad eye strain it is the engineering of really bad eye strain <laughs> everyone's home. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, in an episode that I've dedicated to a movie about super futuristic video games, I am focused on the civil engineering. And isn't that why you all come here in the first place? Suck on that, Ernest Klein! You may have millions of people around the world excited about your nostalgia trip of a movie. I'm getting millions of people excited about basic architecture. Boo! Woo! Who's the truly successful one now? Oh, and fair warning, after this episode, you'll probably never want to visit the the Empire State Building ever again. In Ready Player One, Wade lives in the stacks, monstrous scrap piles of low-income housing that are basically like upright pop
piles of single wide trailer homes. It's a trailer park apartment, basically. Now, according to the book, they can be up to 20 levels high, twice as tall as the smallest skyscrapers. And in the movie, we can see the basic structure of these things. Single trailers stuck all over the place on what the book describes as modular scaffolds, made so they can just keep stacking these things as high as they need to go, which is code for, yeah, we're not gonna be thinking about this ahead of time. As more people move into the area, more trailers just get added to the top. But this creates a major support problem that anyone with a little engineering know-how can immediately see. It's not something that you really have to think about all that often, but turns out that there are some pretty strong reasons why you don't just add on to skyscrapers after they're finished. Your trailer stack doesn't become more efficient, it just becomes a really deadly game of Jenga. Let me explain. Start- Well, the weight? Because, you know, like, the more stuff you add, it would get heavier. So the stuff at the bottom, or the base, would have to be, like, thicker, and it, it, it would have to keep growing. Uh, in order to support the weight, I guess. And also, you know, the higher it goes, there's more wind in that up there, so that would also be a concern. Starting at the bottom, the stacks are going to have a major problem with the foundation. The bigger and heavier any structure is, the stronger the foundation you need. The Exactly. Foundation for a one-story house might have a depth of only one meter, but skyscrapers have foundations that go down 50 meters or more, depending on the soil underneath it. What's that in feet? 164 feet? 164 feet down? That's insane! That's insane! Oh my goodness. <laughs> to get a solid base, you sometimes have to go down hundreds of feet to avoid the building sinking into soft spots later on. The Patronus Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur has the deepest foundation of any skyscraper in the world, ranging from 200 to 374 feet in different places along its base because it's built on soft rock. Why does the building sink? Because of something in civil engineering called compression force, which is the force exerted by the top layers of a building onto the bottom layers. I mean, it totally makes sense. Each layer of a building has to hold up all the layers that get stacked up on top of it. That means that your bottom layers are gonna have to be the strongest and most stable since they're the ones holding the most weight. Applying- Yeah, that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying. So yeah, I think- I think MatPat is a, a real good point here. It's it's the housing that's the problem. This to the stacks in the movie, already you can start to see the issue with this modular approach. Real buildings calculate how much weight they're going to have to support in advance and build their foundations accordingly. Um yeah, and I guess with that, you know, they're built so that you could add stuff on top of it. So I guess when they're building the, uh, the trailer park skyscrapers, you would have to build them anticipating that you would end up putting a lot more on top of it. But yeah, I mean, eventually there's gonna be a limit, and if you go past it, then you have a big problem. Modular building like the stacks isn't able to do that. Every layer that you add on causes the scaffolds and all the mobile homes on lower levels to compress a little bit more. Meaning that without a foundation underneath, eventually these stacks are gonna turn into sinks. Or just collapse inwardly onto themselves. Hate to be the guy on the bottom. I mean, you could argue that they're overbuilding those bottom layers on the chance that you have to add more layers onto the top layer. That's what I was, that's what I was saying, you know, maybe, maybe they think of this beforehand, and they, they prepare for building it up and up and up and up, but I mean, eventually there's gonna be a limit. Also, forgive me for not being so energetic, I'm really tired today, my brain is something, I can't like, think properly as well, just a normal day. Later, but then you're just wasting a lot of money and resources, which, have you seen these things? The whole point of the stacks is to save on money and resources. Another alternative is that, yes, the stacks might not have foundations, but you don't have to build deep if you build wide. Think of the pyramids, or I should say the pyramids after they figured out that they needed to pay attention to things like compression force. You want to see what version 1.0 of the pyramids looked like? Well, here's the bent pyramid. This is a weird one, right? Not a whole lot of historical fictions focused on... I've never seen that one before, or at least I don't think. Is that one real? Is that like the, uh, <laughs> the prototype? The beauty of the Bent Pyramid. Now, I've been to Cairo and seen this thing, which is just as bizarre looking in person. So it is real. So I guess this is like a prototype, and I was like, you know, this no, this doesn't work. The architect probably did not survive after building this. There are a few theories on why this pyramid is the derpy outcast of the Egyptian landscape, but when you discount the crazy theories like aliens, you're left with the exact 
problem we're talking about here in Ready Player One. In the case of the Bent Pyramid, the bottom layers are made of limestone, which is a relatively so soft stone sinking? that expands and contracts with moisture. When the early Egyptians started building this literal prototype of what pyramids would become, the slope on the sides was too steep. It created too much compressive force on the lower levels as the structure got higher, causing the limestone to crush down. The builders responded by changing their angles midway up the pyramid to lessen the pressure on the structure to avoid those stones compressing and warping over time. So a wide and flat foundation is an option, but it can only happen in places where you're not having to account for weather. The only places that you find this sort of construction today is in warmer weather climates like California and Arizona. In colder climates that hit freezing temperatures every winter, the ground is going to freeze and thaw, expand and contract, which means it's going to crack any shallow foundations made of anything like concrete. And at this point, it seems worth mentioning that Ready Player One takes place in Columbus, Ohio, which gets 22 inches of snow per year and makes this kind of foundation a big ol' no-no. But if this whole my trailer stack is sinking into the frozen Ohio ground isn't enough, we've actually got bigger problems to attend to here. The wind. In addition to the vertical- Yeah, that's another thing I was saying. Like, the higher you go up the wind, it gets worse. So the, the force from the wind will be pushing, like, the trailers. You know, it would eventually, like, topple over the buildings. Matt, do you enjoy ruining movies for people? <laughs> force of gravity, skyscrapers also have to deal with the horizontal force of wind, and that means so do our friends hanging out in the stacks. Wind dampening systems are actually incredibly high tech these days. It's not inexpensive engineering either, if you're looking to pay for your stacks with, uh, well, fewer stacks. For example, the Citicorp Center in New York City uses what's called a tuned mass damper to counteract the force of wind on the skyscraper. These types of systems electronically sense shifting pressure in the building due to wind. The damper then uses hydraulics to quickly push a 400 ton concrete slab weight back and forth across the top of the building to shift the building's center of gravity from side to side. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that thus counteracting the force of the wind. So yeah, if you've ever visited one of those world's tallest buildings, just know that there's probably a sliding slab of concrete floating above your head the size of a meteor. No pressure or anything, but sometimes even those sorts of- I mean, that's basically the same if you go into any building or skyscraper or any tower ever, right? I mean, if you're at a, if you're at a lower floor, there are thousands and thousands of pounds of concrete and weight above you, right? So you're basically just relying on the floor not to collapse. Pytech systems aren't enough, especially when you're dealing with the same issues that Ready Player One is dealing with, namely cost. Let's look again at the Citicorp Center in New York. I picked this one on purpose because when it was built, it was actually built with one of the most dangerous design flaws in history. Apologies to anyone who's working there right now and using their lunch break to watch this video. <laughs> to save money, the building wasn't initially constructed using the maximum number of reinforced joints possible, and they weren't making it out of the highest possible quality of steel. Going back to the idea that that better materials have higher compression forces. It was discovered that if the wind blew on the building at a diagonal, any hurricane force winds of 74 miles per hour hitting New York could bring the entire building down, crashing it down onto all the other buildings in the area. Those sorts of winds hit New York about once every 50 years, so obviously a bit of a massive problem. And so to save face, the architect worked in secret with Citigroup to have all the bolts in the building reinforced at night, with crews only working after hours and they managed to fix Oh, that's sneaky. That's very sneaky. It right before hurricane season started. The story didn't surface to the public for over 20 years. So yeah, this is not- oh, Wow. <laughs> we got away with it for 20 years. Well, at least, you know, the architect did something to prevent, you know, a catastrophe from happening. Because if they didn't do anything and you're like, you know what, whatever. That would have been a much bigger problem. Not just a movie problem, there have been some pretty high-profile engineering oopsie moments that could have come close to costing hundreds of thousands of lives around the world, with the powers that be sometimes working behind the scenes to cover that sort of stuff up. Now, of course, the stacks in Ready Player One have no sophisticated computer systems counteracting the effects of wind like this. All of their sophisticated tech is dedicated to entertaining the masses. But no matter how immersive that virtual reality simulation is, it's going to be pretty hard to ignore the fact that your stack comes crashing down with the first lake effect snowstorm of the year. And trust me, Ohio gets plenty of lake effect snowstorms. There's a reason I live in California now. It is cold in them there, cornfields! But on top of the lack of foundation and them just not being reinforced in the slightest, the stacks are actually facing yet another blow when it comes to wind problems because of how narrow they are. Comparing them to a normal apartment building, the skinniest apartment building in New York City- Matt, why do you like ruining these movies for us? 
Why do you do it to us, Matt? You get some kind of sick thrill out of this? The city has an area of 3,300 square feet, which is more than five times the area of a 600 square foot trailer home. Now, at 22 levels high, Wade's home is taller than some skyscrapers, yet it's far thinner than even the thinnest high rises. What does that mean? Well, have you ever tried to stack a single column of Legos up on their own? You notice anything when you did? Maybe that they fall over really darn easily. When trying to figure out whether something is easy to tip over, spoiler alert, the stacks are super easy to tip over. All you need to do is find their center of gravity. Looking just at Wade's stack, which is 22 trailer homes high, if we assume a best case scenario- <laughs> He did an entire video on their- on their house. That's crazy. However, I mean, I agree, it's obviously very dangerous and, uh, basic- But it's a fiction movie, Matt. It's a fiction- with uniform construction that would put the center of gravity between the 11th and 12th levels. Running the numbers, if this stack tilts just 4.7 degrees, its center of gravity will no longer be located over its base, leading the entire thing to tumble over. A sway of 4.7 degrees could happen with gusts of wind at about 40 miles per hour. Maybe even less if you remember that the building also has no support systems and no foundation. Now, considering Ohio's average wind speed sits around 18 miles per hour, the stacks are going to be in a perpetual state of leaning. It's also worth mentioning that since 1950, more than a thousand tornadoes have touched down in Ohio. Ohio is no stranger to high-speed winds sweeping down the plains. So basically, long story- What? Very short, anyone breathing on the stacks too hard means it's game over for Wade. But okay, the stacks are violating some of the basic principles of civil engineering, and they're absurdly unsafe. So what, I hear you saying? Of course they're unsafe. This is a dystopia. They don't exactly have safety in mind when they're building these low-income slums. Wade even describes the domino-like effect when a stack collapses. And in the trailer, we actually see a stack completely obliterated by what seems like a relatively small explosion. These buildings weren't designed to be strong or protect lives. They were designed to be cheap. So stop being nitpicky of Ernest Klein, Matt. Pat, you're just jealous that another nerd is more popular than you. But well, I wasn't gonna say that, but uh, I mean, Matt, Matt, Matt does have a point against himself. But here's the biggest problem with the stacks, you see. They're not cheap either. And this is where we encounter the single biggest problem with the stacks. They're designed for one thing, to cut costs on dense urban housing, and they even suck at that. In fact, they're way more expensive to produce than good old-fashioned concrete slumlord housing. Concrete is seriously cheap. It is literally made out of sand, something that it's safe to say that we won't be running out of in the next 25 years. I thought concrete was expensive, because I know for, um, you know, for, like, to build a bridge, those cost, like, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, uh, I'm pretty sure trailer homes don't cost that. Concrete housing is currently the primary component in urban construction where there's a massive need for more urban homes. The national average cost of building an apartment building in the U.S. is currently around $75 per square foot, or about $45,000 for 600 square feet, the same size as Wade's single-wide trailer. But that's using mid to even high-quality materials. What we're looking for in a Ready Player One scenario are known as Class 6 building materials in the U.S., which consist of reinforced concrete and wood framing, but still has all the major appliances and safety features that you need. These buildings are as low as $57.39 per square foot, or $34,434 for our 600 square foot home. By contrast, a new single wide mobile home costs about $40,000, and that jumps up to $75,000 if you're talking about a double wide. And that is just the trailer. That's not also the cost of getting it all the way to the top of the nearest stack, building extra scaffolding around it, or extending the wires and you do you do have a point there but who's saying they're using new ones right who's saying they're using new ones they could be using old junky ones and even if they are using new ones they could be using like just horrible ones right they aren't like luxury ones right are you sure they're that expensive
cables into the air so that the residents can get their daily dose of Oasis, or the costs of rebuilding these things when catastrophic failures occur. Remember, Wade in the book specifically mentions multiple instances of domino collapses. And if you're still on the fence about it, remember that building codes and inspections are all factored into the current cost of apartment buildings in the US. So if they're willing to just skip that step in Ready Player One, which it seems like they're gonna have no problem doing, you can look at seriously slashing prices on whatever housing you're using in the movie. Oh, and in the process, by building just normal apartment buildings, they would be saving hundreds of lives in the process, but whatever, it's not like those cost anything. So when you go out and see Ready Player One, appreciate the cool technology, dream of the futuristic MMORPGs, but shake your head knowing that the most unbelievable- I mean, it looks cool, Matt. It looks cool. You can- can you at least give it that? It looks cool. I mean, you either have, you know, an apartment, basically, a brick, looks like a brick, or you got these cool-looking Jenga uh, places that people are living. So I, I think it looks cooler, doesn't it? ...and unbelievably deadly part of this fictional reality is literally the house it takes place in. But hey, that's just a theory. I don't even know if I'd say it's a theory. I mean, it's more of a fact. I mean, yes, it's obviously not safe, but it also looks cool. It looks better than... <laughs> It looks cooler than like a normal apartment building. But anyway, I hope you guys like this video. I'm sorry if I wasn't talking that much. I'm really tired right now. I don't feel good. And uh, yeah, I think I I think I think might have a flu coming in. But uh, anyway, if you guys like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Possibly share with a friend if you do. And subscribe to the family. Also, make sure you go subscribe to the Film Theorist. And with that being said, I'll see you guys next time. Boop.